In today's episode, we will start off with a panel discussion of three professionals. This is an interesting conversation and will be of great help and guidance to you. Here, the speakers are a well-known practicing attorney and counselor at law, Mr. Daniel Wright, our name to fame CPA, Mr. Adil Baloch from Accurate Records and Tax Services, and of course, our regular weekly attorney at law, Mr. Ramesh Karana from the Karana Law Firm. So, let's flip the screen over to these well-known personalities. Hello, welcome to the Capital Forum. Today I am really, really privileged to welcome two renowned professionals here. To my immediate left is uh, Daniel Wright, a very experienced and knowledgeable lawyer who has an office in Rockville just in front of the courthouse. Welcome, Mr. Wright. Thank you, Ramesh. And the next gentleman to the extreme left is uh, Mr. Adil Bloch, who is a very well-known CPA who has his office in uh, Montgomery Village, Maryland. And today's topic is, which probably is very close to the hearts of small businesses, because whenever they had to think about buying an existing business or starting a new business, the first thing which comes to their mind is what kind of entity they should form. Now, most of the people, they have this impression that farming a company in Delaware is probably most advantageous. Now, let us listen from Mr. Bloch, like, is there any tax advantage if somebody decides to farm a company in Delaware, especially from the small business uh, uh, owner angle? Sure. Um, a good question. Um, as far as the businesses go, um, there's a concept, or we call it, um, in the tax industry, we call it um, uh, nexus. What that means is that if you have your source of income that is coming out of a certain jurisdiction, the nexus actually takes you there and you actually are liable to pay taxes there. Now granted, you will be able to take credit for those taxes to wherever else you have other income and portion of that. So when you do nexus, you actually take out what you're paying to the other state and you take a credit for the state that you are um, um, paying a portion of taxes to. So keeping that in mind, it really does not make a big difference if you have your business registered out of a certain place. If you are doing business in a certain state and you are actually earning money from that state, it's creating a nexus within that state for you. So there might not necessarily be an advantage in registering a business outside of that state and trying to maybe avoid paying taxes because it's not possible. You still pay taxes where you make money. And from the legal angle, Mr. Wright, what's your view? For a small business, Ramesh, I don't think there is an advantage. In fact, there may be a disadvantage because you will have to keep in good standing in both states. You have to have legal authority to do business in the state in which your business is operating. Mm -hmm. So if you were to do uh, business in Maryland, you have to be authorized to do business in Maryland. If you are incorporated in Delaware, then you're also going to be paying to Delaware. Why pay twice? Uh, the For a small business, uh, there's not very much legal advantage to the laws of Delaware. There might be uh, a bit of an advantage for very large corporations, but not a small company with uh, fewer than 100 shareholders. No, Dan, I agree with you. You have really made a very good point mm -hmm. that just by farming your company in Delaware, it doesn't allow you to do your business in any other state, including no. Maryland. Right. So what you said is basically you need to obtain the authority to do business. And in fact, uh, as far as I know, that in certain states, uh, if you start doing business without filing your articles of incorporation or organization with the particular state where you are doing business, it is considered as misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people just form their company in Delaware, and if they are doing business in Maryland, they start doing business. That's not the way we have to listen to Dan, what mm -hmm. he just said. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Now, uh, again, this question is uh, to you, Mr. Bloch. Now, when people form their LLCs, so uh, there may be multiple uh, uh, people owned LLC or a single person owned mm -hmm. LLC. So tell us what is the automatic situation in regard to the tax filing and whether they can convert into S Corp or C Corp. Sure, sure. So a single member LLC, um, automatically becomes a sole proprietorship. 
Now, same same LLC, um, you add another member to it. That's the, the, the default uh, structure for that one becomes a partnership. Um, both of them uh, are subject to the, the net income on both of them is subject to self-employment taxes. Uh, one way to actually not do that and pay self-employment taxes only on the salary that you get, not on the profit of the business itself, is to convert it to an S-corporation. Um, and that's probably the largest benefit that you have in the different structures that you have, the LLCs being the LLCs, be it a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Um, you are subject to Social Security and Medicare on the entire income versus just the, just the payroll that you get from that, comp from that business. So you would recommend S Corporation is the best form for small businesses because you avoid paying self-employment taxes and also Medicare and Social Security over and above your compensation Correct. which you over have Over and above value. your compensation, exactly, because everything else that comes to you um, as a net income from the business is only subject to income taxes, not Social Security, Medicare, and, 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 and those kind of taxes. No, uh, uh, I, Mr. Wright, yeah, please go ahead. I, I understand that there are some uh, uh, timelines that a person has to be careful of mm -hmm. in electing to be an S corporation. Sure, sure. Could you explain Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So, uh, so uh, the basic rule is that you have to apply for the S corporation election to be effective from January 1 of a particular year before March 15th of that year. Okay. If you miss that deadline, now you have to wait for the following year. Oh. Now, there are some exceptions granted to the rule uh, mm -hmm. wherein if it's a new brand new corporation, and mm -hmm. what if you register it after March 15th? It's a brand new corporation. You do qualify for a late election in that case. I in see. some cases, you can actually, as long as you justify it, as mm -hmm. long as there's a proper justification for it, late election could be as far out as 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, now you have to do a whole lot of extra work and provide all this uh, evidences and justification on why you missed it, but you could potentially go up to 24 months. But as I always recommend to everyone, if you want to really keep it simple, just open it before March 15, do the S corporation election before March 15, you will not have to deal with any of the hassles after that. So the thumb rule is that within 75 days, Correct. you have to file form 2553 Correct. with the IRS Correct. so that you have the S corporation Correct. status. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, same way if the people decide to terminate their S corporation status, so again, they can do it, of course, but they have to also do the necessary filing with the Correct. IRS. Correct. Yeah. So it defaults back to what the whatever the original uh, um, uh, legal structure was uh, of the um, um, of, of of the business prior to being being converted to an S corporation, um, and that is why in cases where people actually like to consider it to be a corporation as opposed to an LLC. Uh, there's another form that you can fill out and actually convert it to a corporation before you convert it to an S corporation. So that the default now becomes corporation and if you decide to revoke the S corporation election, it defaults back to the corporation as opposed to going back to the LLC structure. Okay. Now let's move on. Now let us discuss uh, how S corporations are uh, taxed. Um, yeah. is, it, is it true that an S corporation is taxed just like a partnership? Um, actually, Yes or no? Uh, partially, yes. People think it is that. a pass-through. It's okay. a pass-through entity. The difference between partnership and S-corporation is that the income coming to you through a partnership is subject to Social Security and Medicare. So remember the default um, status, mm -hmm. LLC, sole proprietorship, and partnership. They're one and the same. It's just that one is multi-member, one is single member. Both the incomes are sub subject to Social Security and Medicare versus S-corporation, the distributions or the net income is only subject to income taxes, not Social Security and Medicare. However, for an S corporation, the owners or the management is required to pay them a reasonable, comparable compensation, meaning if you were to hire somebody else to do what you are doing, how much will you pay them? And that's the kind of salary you are required to pay yourself. What that means is that you pay Social Security and Medicare as an employee and employer only on that salary that's coming to you. Rest of the income that's part of the bottom line of the business comes to you as a pass-through entity. You pick it up uh, for coming uh, from a pass-through entity as income, but it's, uh, it's a form called K-1. You get that income and then you capture that as income on your individual or personal tax return and you only pay uh, income taxes on that income after all the deductions that are available to you. Um, no Social Security and Medicare taxes on that. So my understanding is that in the case of an S corporation, you are both 
the owner and the employee whereas in case of an llc you are just the owner just the owner but then as when it comes to taxes you're paying taxes as owner and employee both yeah correct now uh, moving ahead uh, when a person can form an s corporation what is the eligibility criteria maybe dan you like to tell us well they can't be more than 100 shareholders mm -hmm. and none of the entity's shareholders can be non-resident aliens a non-resident alien is a non-citizen who doesn't live within the United States. There can only be one class of stock. There can't be preferred stock or preferred uh, people within the corporation who control everything. And none of the entity's shareholders can be other corporations or partnerships. Great. So basically when you said that uh, no non-resident it's not concerned with the immigration status because I'm an immigration no. lawyer. <laughs> so it doesn't matter whether you are a green card holder or a citizen or even sometimes you are just holding your employment authorization card. You are waiting for your green card to come. Mm -hmm. Still, you can form a company. Yes, you and can. And you can be the owner of an S corporation or LLC because once you get the employment authorization document, you are issued a social security number. This is what you need to satisfy the requirement of the pass-through entity. Uh-huh, I see. Yeah. So, now, uh, let's talk about uh, why people form LLCs and S corporations because they would like to limit their personal liability. Nobody wants to be responsible for the debts owed by the LLC or the corporation. I would like to expand on this thought, uh, uh, Dan. Ramesh, uh, limited liability is one of the oldest concepts in business law. It started in England hundreds of years ago. And the idea is that it will make it easier for people to start a business if they don't have to risk everything they have in order to do so. So they limit the liability, the potential liability, to your investment in the business. And if people can do that, then they're more likely to invest their capital in business, and it's better for the economy, uh, better for everyone, mm -hmm. if you can limit your liability in this way. And uh, an S corporation or an LLC, a corporation, they all have the concept of limited liability. But as you know, it's not an absolute limit it can be breached in certain circumstances yeah so I think uh, it will be interesting to dis discuss about the circumstances under which uh, the piercing of the veil is allowed mm -hmm. by the course which of course is very rare I understand especially in the state of uh, Maryland uh, hardly courts decide to allow to pierce the veil is it correct they they rarely do mm -hmm. however if the company is really just a shell, if it's not a real company, not operating as a company, if the owner is commingling his assets with the, the company, if he doesn't keep the uh, filings up to date with the State Department of Assessments and Taxation, if he uh, doesn't pay his taxes, if he doesn't operate under the corporate name, then in these certain circumstances, they very well may uh, make the owner liable. Wonderful. Uh, I know that there can be certain circumstances whereby the owners, mm -hmm. they are withholding taxes from the employee's salary, but they are failing to deposit with the authorities. Yeah. If, they, if that's the kind of conduct, they are going to be responsible. And likewise, if somebody is doing intentionally something yes. to injure or some kind of reckless behavior, then that person is going to be responsible personally, despite the fact that he is the member or owner of an LLC. If you uh, recall, we had this discussion at the, uh, during our uh, corporate tax resolution um, uh, topic. Uh, the the uh, trust fund becomes a personal liability, gets transferred over to the owner as a personal debt, and now they have to pay it. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for coming to the studio and participating in this group discussion. The topic, uh, I think, was very interesting. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, thank you Adil. And we really enjoyed the discussion. I'm sure audience must have been benefited immensely by this group discussions. Hopefully, we will see you soon. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.